All right, fantastic. Um, I think uh, we might get a start and I think uh, more, more and more participants will join in um, as, as the event picks up. So hello everyone, my name's Bowen and I'm the moderator of this panel discussion as well as its organizer. Um, thank you for being here with us this evening as we discuss a difficult and very visible topic in Canberra, which is that of homelessness. Um, so although we are hosting this meeting virtually, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people, um, on which we are hosting this meeting and pay respect to uh, the elders of the Ngunnawal nation, both past and present. Um, I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, Islander people in attendance today. Um, so once again, for those who've just joined us, my name is Bowen and I'm one, I'm one of the uh, student ambassadors for the ANU learning communities. Um, and this is a program that sits within the engagement and success team at the ANU. Um, the ANU learning communities team facilitates learning outside of the classroom. Uh, we organize and host events around five major themes, which are global challenges, sustainability, cultures, creative arts, and history. Uh, we explore topical issues in a format that's accessible to all students, faculty, and the, wide, the wider public. Um, if you're interested in any of our other events, check out our Facebook page because that's where we advertise all our events. Just type in yeah, ANU Learning Communities and it should be the first result. Um, so, yeah, just firstly, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a sixth year ANU um, student studying a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Laws, and I'm doing honours research into Chinese politics, which is, as you can see, um, not something that's that very related to homelessness. Um, but it's a topic, uh, yeah, it's not a topic in which I have any academic knowledge, but something I was really interested in. Um, so the inspiration for this event came to me, um, came about to me when I was driving through a Civic, uh, just with, with my partner a couple of uh, weeks ago and uh, yeah, we saw a few homeless people huddle together and um, we had a conversation about how brutal the being homeless uh, in at the Canberra winter must be and shortly afterwards I had a homeless man knock on my door asking for change um, which was yeah, a really confronting sort of thing um, something I had never really experienced before um, so not long afterwards, in my capacity as an ANU Learning Communities Ambassador, I decided to run an event and bring, it, bring in some experts and community leaders to talk about this issue. Um, so firstly, just a bit of housekeeping. The structure of tonight will be as follows. Um, so as you can see on the screen, we've got um, our three speakers, uh, Louise Gilding, Anne Kerwin and James O'Donnell. Um, so each of them will uh, give a 10 to 15 minute sort of uh, talk on their areas of expertise and their experiences um, in dealing with homelessness, um, both in Canberra and generally. Um, after that, uh, we've got some questions prepared for our um, panelists, um, just uh, about um, what we as um, students and the uh, general community can do to combat homelessness. Um, as well as uh, bring in, bringing in certain international perspectives um, and seeing the, the feasibility of their implementation. Um, and towards the end, we'll have a Q&A section. Um, as you can see at the bottom, there's a uh, yeah, Q&A function uh, in which you can sort of, you can type your, any questions you may have and we'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll read these questions out to the, uh, to the panelists and have them answer, have them answer these questions. Um, we'll try and, get through as many questions as possible, but uh, just no promises that we'll get through your question um, in particular. Um, now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight. So first up, we have uh, Louise Gilling. So Louise uh, is a strong believer in the ACT community and has done so for the last 20 years. Um, she currently leads the delivery of public housing and homelessness services in the ACT, uh, which includes responsibilities for housing and homelessness policy and uh, public housing renewal. Um, and yeah, a bit of tenancy management work as well. Um, after Louise, uh, Anne will be speaking. Um, Anne is the CEO of Catholic Care Canberra and Golden. So Anne is a registered psychologist with over 20 years of experience in the social services sector um, and has held the position of CEO of Catholic Care uh, Canberra and Golden since 2014. Um, and commenced her career working in homelessness um, services in particular and has overseen youth, employment, mental health and uh, disability and aged care services delivery um, during her time with Catholic Care. And um, 
After Anne, we'll have um, James. Um, Dr. James O'Donnell is a demographer at the, um, ANU, um, at the ANU, and his current research deals with um, understanding and measuring social cohesion, um, with social cohesion within and across neighborhoods. Uh, his broader research uh, interests include housing and homelessness, uh, labor market and household dynamics, as well as uh, social and demographic change. Um, so from here on, um, I'll let this panelists take it away. Um, looking forward to hearing what each of you has to say. Um, so first up, we have Louise, um, who will be uh, um, talking about the, uh, the causes of homelessness and um, homelessness in Canberra in particular. Thank you, thank you, Bowen. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you can um, see me there? Yeah. So um, welcome, everybody. And it, look, it's a real privilege to um, to present tonight and talk to you about a topic that I am um, very very passionate about, and that is housing and homelessness um, in in the ACT. Um, I love this city, and I pay my respects to um, the Ngunnawal people whose land we're meeting on, and um, to their elders, past and present. And look, I've made Canberra my home for the past. Over, over the past 40, over 40 years. And um, I'm um, grateful that I can actually make a contribution to this city um, to make it actually a better place. And at the moment, I um, have been um, heading up the um, housing ACT uh, for the public um, ACT government. Um, I'm the executive group manager there. And so I look after our 12,000 odd um, public housing um, houses plus all of our homelessness services. So what I might do now is I've, I've got a bit of a presentation um, just to take you through some numbers and some stats um, and um, I will share my screen. Let me do that now and I'm hoping my screen is being shared. Is that right? Yep, great and I'm hoping now that you've actually got the full screen there in terms of the um, um, presentation there. So um, the causes of homelessness are, um, and can you tell me, have you got my notes or have you got um, the full screen there? Actually, let me oh, just change that. We can see your notes as well. Um, Sorry, please. you can see my notes as well, okay. Hang on two seconds and we will just try and um, swap that round for you. Uh, sorry about this. Got double screens and they're a little bit tricky. <laughs> um, hang on, let me just stop sharing that. And try again. Um, bear with me. You might just have to have it like this. Sorry about that, folks. Um, no it, it wants to. <laughs> it wants to share my screen in a particular way. So we'll just do it this way, and hopefully you can all see. So hopefully you can see that now. Um, so look, um, housing and homelessness, the, you know, the causes are, um, are, are very complex and um, the contribution, the factors that actually contribute to homelessness can be traced back to many aspects of society, including um, tax settings, income supports, justice and corrections, planning, health, education, housing, child protection and mental, cha um, mental health. And homelessness is often um, a consequence of several factors cascading into crisis, resulting in individuals and families being without a home. And so what we see is that these factors can generally be grouped under three themes. The first is the structural, which are around your income supports 
and housing supply, for example, access to affordable housing. Um, the second can be um, systemic factors such as inadequate discharge planning from facilities and lack of appropriate support programs. Um, and the third can then be individual factors such as job losses, accident, relationship breakdown and family violence. And what's really critical is that there are different players who control those different factors. So different levels of government have responsibility or influence over those different various structural system and individual factors. And what's really important is the interplay between these factors, between the systems, between levels of government um, that contribute to homelessness. So it doesn't, homelessness doesn't restrict itself to any administrative level or any jurisdiction. You know, pretty much we're all in this together, much like COVID. It's not just the Commonwealth's problem. It's not just a problem for the states um, and territories. But by understanding the various factors, we can actually understand the problem better and the part we play, and then we can figure out what we actually need to do about it. So often um, in homelessness, we see well-meaning people thinking um, that they have an understanding of what the problem actually is, um, but not necessarily um, providing or understanding the true need um, that sits behind homelessness. So there's often a number that's quoted, you know, it's, it's um, where does that 1,600 people per night at or any given night in the ACT, homelessness, homeless, where does that come from? And often people think, whenever I ask the question, you know, uh, how many rough sleepers do you think we have? Sometimes people say we've got upwards of 500,000, 1,600 people actually sleeping on our streets. But the thing to understand is that homelessness is not ruthlessness. And so that 1,600 number comes from our census data. Um, it comes from um, the way the Australian Bureau of Statistics defines a person as homeless. And you can see those three categories there on the screen. If they are homeless, if their current dwelling is inadequate, if they don't have secure tenure, or it doesn't allow them to have control and access to the space. So think about, you know, somebody couch surfing doesn't really have control um, of the space um, around them. So the ABS then has six homelessness groups. Category one are people who are actually on our streets, who are actually rough sleeping in um, tents or sleeping out. So one, one they were possibly some of the people that you encountered on the street. But the other part of that is that not everybody on our street is actually homeless. A lot of, you'll find that a lot of people who are on low incomes need to supplement their incomes by actually being out on the street. So often it's the folk who have locked their trolleys with them or their sleeping bags with them. The, the, those are, tend to be the characteristics of people who are on our street. The other category I'd like to point out here in the ABS stats is category number two. And this is a person who lives in supported accommodation for the homeless. Now, as a jurisdiction, we have um, a high proportion of supported accommodation, but that gets counted in our 1600 homelessness stats. So these are people who are actually being supported. They have accommodation. They're on a pathway out, uh, potentially in the Axial Housing First program, but they're counted as homeless. So what we've got to understand there is those categories of um, groups that the ABS uses sometimes count apples and oranges together. So let's have let's drill down now and actually have a look at those data sets there. I'm hoping you can see that. Um, what you can see there in terms of our um, the comparison then between the two data the, the census data. Um, and what you've got, you've got the 2011 numbers and the 2016 numbers. And what you'll see there is in that first category, we did actually have a jump. We jumped from 28 rough sleepers to 54. But overall, we actually saw a, a decline in our rate of homelessness per head of population. So um, we went from 13.7, we, we, while the homelessness figures rose 13.7% nationally between those two censuses, homelessness declined by 8% in the ACT, even though we had a population increase by about 11%. So our, our rate of population per head of has also declined. Um, it was 48.7 per 10,000. In 2016, it's now 40.2. Um, 
And much of that focus can be attributed when we look at other parts of our data, can be attributed to um, focusing into early in a crisis and intervening early and preventing people. So there's a category called those people who are at risk of homelessness. What we've been trying to do is work with services to keep that roof that that person has over their head if it's, if it's safe to do so, rather than trying to help them when we see them on the streets. So some of the characteristics between the changes that we saw between 2011 and 2016, we saw a rise in the proportion of males who were homeless. We actually saw a decline in the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, we saw a rise in homelessness among those born overseas. And I think anecdotally, we, we, we try and unpack some of the data, but we think that's seen in our overcrowding um, situations where we see lots of fam fa different generations of family actually living in, um, living in the one house and sharing, sharing, um, sharing housing costs that way. Um, we've also seen a rise in the proportion of those over 55 years, and particularly in that category, uh, we are concerned about the number of um, homeless uh, older women who are experiencing homelessness. So that's one set of data we've got in terms of the ABS census. It happens every four years. Um, it's uh, every four, five years, I should say. Um, but it's not. It doesn't really tell us what's happening on a on an annual basis or a daily basis, monthly basis on our streets. And so what we have is another other data sets in terms of. Um, the client data through the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And what we can actually see is that our client data has actually matched our ABS data in terms of that overall trending down. And you can see what you've got there in front of you is the number of people who sought our specialist homelessness services. And you can see that as, um, has, has declined from 4987 to you know around 4000 um, in 17-18. I have to say, right at this moment with COVID, we are seeing this data turn around and we are absolutely seeing an uptick in people accessing these services as we as as back to those structural issues that i was talking about before and the systems issues if you don't have a job it's really hard to pay the rent um, so but what we what we see there is that our early intervention has um, actually trended down and what we've seen is a, in that data is the rise of people who are um, at risk of homelessness as opposed to those people who are homeless. So that's the difference between the blue and the pink squares that you're actually seeing there. So because we're intervening early, we actually want to see a rise in the clients who are accessing our services who are at risk. That means we're actually doing, our, our services are having an impact. But we still wanted to know more. Um, and so, um, what we were seeing in our client data was uh, a cyclical nature of repeat homelessness. And so we uh, worked with um, a, um, some researchers, much like James, who's going to be speaking to us later, I think, um, to understand it better. And so we commissioned a port report, our cohort study, to better understand the specialist care and support and accommodation requirements of people who we define have having high and complex needs. Um, and a per, the people who had the report, the study defined those people with high and complex needs um, as um, having a mental health issues or medical issues, drugs, substance or alcohol misuse, and exiting from custody or out of home care. And so of the 20,000 clients over that six year period who sought support, of those clients, about 10%, or 380 people each year had high and complex service needs. 200 of those were at risk of homelessness, so they still had a roof, but they were at risk of losing their tenancy, and 180 were actually homeless. Um, what we saw of people who were at risk rose while the number of homelessness fell, so that's that early intervention. But what we've also been seeing is part of that data is that we have a rising of, of the people who access our, our client support of those 4,000 odd people, we are actually seeing a rise of clients with high and complex needs. So on that, side, on that screen there, you'll see of the 4,500 people in 16, 17 that sought assistance from our specialist homelessness services, you'll see the range of, um, 
of complexities that people actually experienced. Mental health, 36%. But also note how um, domestic violence is all our homelessness um, statistics there. Interestingly, and I'll, I pulled out this data because I thought, you know, I'm speaking to young people um, and I'll just find out the research um, the research showed us that the portion of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with high and complex needs was rising. The portion of older women was rising. In contrast, there was actually a notable decrease in the portion of younger people, so 15 to 24 years, with high and complex needs. All right, so mate, there's a, there's a subset of this whole group who were homelessness, who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. So over the six years from 2011 to 12, the proportion of homeless youth with high and complex service needs fell from 41% to almost 21%, while the proportion of those at risk fell from 24 to 18. So we're having an impact, but what that's also telling us is what's the type of service that youth and young people will need. Perhaps they don't need the same services as those with those other, with with the high and complex needs that we are actually seeing. They maybe they need a different intervention as part of that prevention, and which is what I'm hoping we, we're going to talk about um, later on. So that cohort study has helped us actually design um, uh, some great programs. Um, it pointed out to us that the staircase. Our specialist homelessness sector needs to change, um, and Anne from um, Anne is probably will talk next about um, our latest housing first pilot, Axial. But the Gay City government has two housing first um, projects at the moment. One is Common Ground uh, in Gungarland. We're building a second Common Ground in Dixon, and then we have the Axial program. But I'm going to I'll, I'll leave that to Anne to talk more about. But overarching all of this, so what, you've got all of this data, how do you bring it together in a strategy? So just quickly, we do have the ACT housing strategy. It's got five key goals because we know that homelessness is complex and it's about the whole continuum. It's about having a supply of housing. It's about having a supply of affordable housing. Um, and um, it's about making sure we've got affordable rental. And you can see those five goals there. So for me, um, I work mainly on goals two and three, reducing homelessness. Um, we put $24 million, nearly 25 of annual funding into homelessness programs to meet those needs of those 4,000 um, clients that I was just talking about. We have 28 specialist homelessness providers across the ACT. Axial, Common Ground are part of those programs. Um, and we have a range of, uh, you know, 50 programs, everything from material aid to the early morning service, to street to home, uh, to crisis support and accommodation that meet all of those different cohorts. On the screen there, you'll see what we've um, done during COVID in terms of scaling up our response for women, for men, um, for, for those sleeping rough and having a flexible client support fund because we don't know quite what we're going to see, but we do know that we need to be able to be agile and pivot and make sure that we bring together supports and, and accommodation for people. Um, so that's in the homelessness space. We, but you know, it's no good trying to solve homelessness if you don't have houses. And so um, we are also building social housing. Some of you might be aware of um, the announcements made by the um, government um, last week to actually increase and extend um, the growth of the um, public housing portfolio and also renewal. Renewal is important. Because if you are on a disability pension or you're aging, you need a property that you can access and that's actually adapted for you, for you as you age or, you know, you can access in a wheelchair. So that's, look, that's around the world, Bowen. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I do have my questions for, you know, hopefully that we can talk about in terms of well, what can we do specifically for students and focusing on in terms of, you know, some of the thoughts there um, that, you know, we might be able to get into a bit more of a discussion later on. But uh, thank you for the opportunity and I will hand to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Louise. That was fantastic. And I think it was it was really interesting seeing the statistics um, and just to, to delineating between the sets of statistics that are actually useful, um, I think, and also the policies, um, the policy goals of the ACT government. I think this gives us a really solid foundation to for to know what we're dealing with. Um, and I think uh, also, yeah, 
serves as a good segue into what Anne will talk about, which is, um, I suppose, uh, community efforts, um, how community efforts use these statistics to sort of, um, yeah, to actually yeah, to sort of tackle the problem of homelessness. Um, so from here on, I'll hand over to Anne to uh, talk about um, Axial Housing. Great, thanks, uh, Bolwan and Louise. So hi, everybody, I hope you can hear me. Bolwan, am I good? Yep. Lovely. Um, so my name's Anne Kerwin and I'm the CEO of Catholic Care Canberra Goulburn and we are the social services arm of the um, Catholic Church in this region. Um, I'm very excited to be talking to a whole bunch of ANU students. I studied um, psychology at ANU uh, and certainly um, I remember studying abnormal psychology and wondering if ever I would ever meet somebody who um, had this thing that we called uh, schizophrenia. And um, one of my uh, very first jobs uh, was in the homelessness sector and I, I at Ainsley Village for 10 years. And on my first day, I ran into about 10 people who were clearly um, hallucinating and delusional and talking to vending machines and inanimate objects. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, this is, this is what that was about. So um, uh, I've had a background in homelessness for a long time. Um, and uh, I certainly would encourage many of you to pursue uh, a career um, in the helping services because it's a wonderful uh, place to work. Now, I'm going to share my screen, which is the first time I've ever done this, so Bolwan will help me if this doesn't work. Um, it's not my strength uh, technology. And so, can you all see that? Yep, works perfectly. Yep. Beautiful. Okay, and I think I'll just, yep, beautiful. So I'm here tonight to talk about axial housing. I am a very fast speaker, so uh, strap yourselves in, but I know I've only got um, 10 to 15 minutes. I go um, and there'll be questions at the end. So um, what is Axial Housing? So Axial Housing is, as Louise said, a pilot uh, uh, a program in the ACT. It's a Housing First initiative and it's a partnership between Catholic Care, who are the homelessness and support providers, and the ACT government who have provided the properties. And Catholic Care is head leasing the properties of the ACT government. Um, it exists um, to assist people who are sleeping rough on the streets of Canberra to move from the streets into permanent housing. And a key part of this model is the provision of wraparound supports to those tenants um, to support them to have their needs met and also to sustain their accommodation. Um, as Louise mentioned, uh, Axial Housing came um, through some discussions that we were having with the ACT government around how do we respond to needs and in particular in response to the cohort study that's basically said that the homelessness service uh, system in, in, in Australia and in the ACT was a stepped model where you have to go, you know, you typically enter crisis and then you go to short and then you go to medium and then you go to long term and then if you're lucky you then exit into permanent housing. So you have to go through stages. And what it was saying is that stepped model is failing um, people um, with high and complex support needs because they simply cannot navigate um, the steps and they give up. Um, and so we as a, as a sector need to then look at, well, what is happening? These are our models of service and support. How can we change the way we work to be able to provide accommodation and meet the needs of people with high and complex needs? And out of that conversation uh, came Axial Housing. Um, and, and the, the key part of that is, is this is, it's different to rapid rehousing. This is a housing first model where literally people move from the street into permanent accommodation with support. Uh, started initially with 20 tenancies, which is fantastic. 20 people sleeping rough on the sleeps would access permanent housing. And then the gift of the coronavirus has been that um, the AC government is extremely motivated to move as many people as possible off the streets because they're at high risk in terms of infection. Um, and so there were another 12 properties allocated. So in fact, the pilot is going to support uh, 32 people sleeping rough, which is wonderful. Uh, in terms of uh, rough sleeping, it's very important to be um, clear about who are rough sleepers. So rough sleepers are a subgroup of people who are homeless. Um, so, so axial housing, you might say, well, 32 properties, that's not gonna address it. It is not a, a model or a service to help every homeless person in the ACT, people who are, are rough sleepers. And typically the definition there is it's people um, who are 
we're on the sleep and sleeping in uh, places that are not designed to be slept, slept in. So we know that they're, they're um, on the streets, they're in um, doorways, cars, um, tents, uh, unsafe shelters. Just noting, of course, uh, Louise said the population, only 3% of the population, a homeless population, are sleeping rough in the ACT. Um, and of course, uh, our, our position is that they require additional support to be able to navigate the system to, to move through. So our actual housing has a three phase to work with people. The first one um, can at times be the most challenging and that is where we are working with people and a number of providers who are making referrals to us and we're looking at building a, a, a relationship with someone who's on the streets, uh, gaining their trust and supporting them uh, to uh, consider um, actual housing as an option and, and taking a referral into the program. Um, and certainly you'll see later on that there's a large proportion of this uh, client group who have long-term mental health issues and are extremely unwell um, and, and paranoid and suspicious of strangers. So this can be very challenging. And that's where the partnerships with St Vincent de Paul and the Early Morning Centre and the Red Cross are important because they have long-term relationships with this client group and they can refer into us. And certainly over time, what we have seen is that a number of clients are telling their friends that um, uh, Catholic care and axial housing is helping people. And so we're actually getting people uh, referring their friends or self-referring, which is, which is fantastic, which is what we want. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of the subgroup, the way that um, we are looking at um, supporting people is it, it is to target the people who cannot navigate the system. So if you have someone who's accessed a homelessness service or is housed in a homelessness service, um, then typically they're already demonstrating the skills that says that they can navigate the sector and enter the sector. And we are interested in the people who five, 10, 15, 20 years sleeping rough on the streets of Canberra. Um, so the, the first phase is uh, intake and referral and building, building relationships and rapport. The second uh, phase is, the, is the, the really busy phase, which is the moving. So this is where we work in partnership with Housing ACT. We put in a request around the needs of the client. So it could be that they have a dog, or it could be that they have mobility issues and need to be on the ground floor, or it could be that they need grab rails, or it could be that they can't live in high density uh, accommodation because of uh, a number of issues. So we work with housing to try and, um, where possible, get them a suitable property. Then within Catholic Care, our property arm work with the tenant, they actually sign a lease, they send up rental payments, and we spend a lot of time talking to them about um, what it means to be a good tenant, not just in terms of looking after the property, but relationship with neighbours and conflict management and that sort of stuff. Then our maintenance arm helps set up the phone. We provide all the furniture, white goods, linen. We set up the kitchen. Um, and we also provide grocery packs as well um, so that when uh, people move in, they, their house is actually livable. They've got a bed. They've got food in the fridge. Um, they've got a washing machine. All of those are basic essentials. Um, and then our actual team actually support the client to actually transition um, and adjust to living in their own home. And that's often transporting them with all their possessions into their home and working with them to set it up. The third phase is then the ongoing support, which is really um, our bread and butter, but is the most crucial element in terms of the model. So that's a provision of ongoing support um, and linking um, people into additional services and supports. Um, and obviously, um, there's a huge amount of work that needs to go in here. We certainly find that um, there's a large number of clients that have um, mental health issues, but also um, physical health issues, um, really terrible um, dental um, health and hygiene, um, because people have not been accessing um, medical services and systems for a number of years. And so a lot of work needs to go in that space in terms of uh, making referrals and providing support so people can get access to care services. Uh, obviously, long term, what we are really keen to do is to link people um, with long-term uh, permanent support such as the NDIS. Um, and, uh, that is a very complex uh, process, but we're very experienced in doing that. So um, we're already starting to work with people in terms of what are their needs and how can they access that through other systems that are not the homelessness sector. An idea in terms of who are the current people that we are supporting. So 85% male, 10% female, and 5% uh, transgender. Average age is between 43 and 53, uh, and the average length of time difference for everybody, but it basically ranges from 12 months to 25 years. And tomorrow, uh, Louise will be pleased to know that we are housing a gentleman who has been on the streets for 30 years. 
um, and so he's getting his flat tomorrow, which is amazing. wow, Anne. Yeah, that's cool. amazing. That's fantastic. So uh, we've got uh, ab obviously Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander call. Um, the, the interesting part here is that 100% um, of the clients have mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues and or childhood trauma. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute in terms of um, what, how people ended up on the streets of Canberra. But that's, that is the absolute crucial element there in terms of getting use of the client. Of our clients have dogs. 100% of our tenants who, uh, and the program's been running now for nine months, nearly 10 months, um, are paying their rent in full. So some of the um, perceptions of people around that they, they won't pay their rent, that's incorrect. They are paying their rent in full. We have no issues with that. 100% um, of the clients that we accessed um, were linked in with existing homelessness services. Um, uh, so they were accessing the Early Morning Centre or St Vincent de Paul, some sort of charitable service. Um, and getting free food and services like that. And 100% of our clients had an income while they were living on the streets. And that is probably because they were linked in with existing homelessness service who were working with them. It's also important because um, to, for clients to be able to move into Axial, they need to be housing ready in some form with support. And a key component of that is they have to be in a position to pay their rent. So we certainly have had people living on the streets who we've met um, would like to live in Axial House refuse to pay any rental and of course that is not sustainable tenancy so then um, that's not possible for them to move in. Um, in terms of reasons why um, our uh, this uh, cohort of, of people have remained homeless this is where it's uh, really about uh, complex um, history. There's never as a result of a series of unfortunate events um, and when we talk to our clients typically we're talking about childhood trauma, mistreatment, abuse, neglect, family violence, uh, you can have um, injury that can sometimes re result then in drug and alcohol addiction, uh, chronic pain, ongoing health issues, loss of job, business failure, relationship breakdown, uh, drug and alcohol misuse, um, brain injury and traumatic in injuries are, are common. Um, the next one, obviously, is a big one, which is mental health issues. These can result in the tenant um, often being unable to navigate the system and engage with bureaucracy to get onto um, uh, benefits, um, to access and sustain themselves on housing waiting lists, to get support letters. All of those issues um, can be very challenging. Uh, we see a lot of antisocial behaviours. Um, that can result in the tenant's... Um, uh, typically, they need to live alone. Shared living, where they share kitchens with other people, bathrooms, that sort of thing, like some of the university accommodation, it doesn't work for this cohort of people. There's too many interpersonal issues and the accommodation breaks down. So typically, this is a group of people who, for a variety of reasons, need to live on their own. Then there's lifestyle issues. So that can be drug and alcohol or actually having pets. And this can really be challenging because um, you would know that in the homelessness sector, a number of our services exclude people from accessing our services if they have dogs, if they're actively using drugs and alcohol. So it, it, it can, the barriers for people accessing housing are created by us, our, our, the services that are there to deliver uh, to them. So that is a challenge for us in terms of how we work within that space. Uh, and the last one, obviously, is debts that, um, for a number of reasons above, certainly a number of our tenants have um, long-term debts with housing ACT or other providers, and they may become major barriers to them accessing supports. Ongoing challenges for us in terms of axial housing, well, the first one uh, with, with over 90% of our clients having mental health issues, and, and we're talking long-term and chronic, we don't like to use that language, but that is the language, um, that is the appropriate classification. Um, uh, we're talking about cycles of unwellness. And so, you know, we've got examples, and this is where we work very closely with housing ACT, where people can be travelling along okay, and then suddenly they ring our staff because of some conspiracy that our staff have put the police onto them or that we've bugged their house or whatever. Uh, we've had clients remove doors, remove windows, um, pull houses apart because the houses have been bugged or whatever. Um, they then exit the property, cancel their rent, uh, go back onto the streets, we work with them, we support them, and hopefully the goal is they then re-enter the property. Um, and so that is, a, that is a challenge for us in terms of this, uh, this uh, group of people, but it's also one of the benefits where typically what would happen is they would exit, um, they, housing may or may not know, a couple of months later there's a, there's a massive debt, the property's got um, squatters in there being vandalised, 
um, and the, the property is returned to housing ACT. Um, and then of course, when the client wishes to re-enter housing, they end up with a very large debt in their name when they actually had nothing to do with it, but they didn't advise housing, they were exiting the property. So we're working really hard to make sure that that people exit, we support them to exit, and hopefully we wanna actively hold them until they're in a better place to re-enter their property. And we're, we're working with Louise and her team to make sure we do that and we do that well for people. Um, and the, the service has been open for eight or nine months. We've already had two people who have exited and returned within a two week period, um, specifically relating to mental illness. Of course, we've got um, challenging drug and alcohol use. I don't go into explaining what that is about. Um, ongoing antisocial behaviours, and that can be um, uh, at times incredibly aggressive behaviour towards everybody, including our staff. Um, and that's part of the reason that people have been on the streets and sleeping rough is because the real challenge of being able to get along with other people. Isolation is an interesting one for us. Um, seeming strange, but um, our tenants are re reporting an increase in feeling isolation when they move into their units. They've gone from the streets and being surrounded by people to being in a in a building with four walls. Four walls quiet um, and also that's been affected by COVID where typically we would have referred people into other services and supports to create um, a whole group of networks and activities for themselves but all of those have shut down because of COVID so we're really seeing that our clients are having less interaction with it on the streets and they're really noticing that. So uh, it's a challenge for us the tenants report that they are uh, feeling both safer having their own home and feeling unsafe because one of the things about sleeping on the streets is there a problem you just pack up your stuff and you walk away or you get in your car and you drive off and you stay somewhere else but we've put them in a property where they have a lease and they have to get along with their neighbours and if there's a problem with their neighbours they really feel st stuck so um, it's it's a complex issue that one. Uh, complex needs and comorbidity, that's typically around mental illness, drug and alcohol, acquired brain injury, um, and that leads to a number of challenging issues in terms of managing tenancies. And the last one's around vulnerability and poor decision making. So these tenants are incredibly vulnerable to predation, um, being taken advantage of. Um, they also typically have a history of making poor decisions that can result in external people taking advantage or making demands on them. So that can be um, owing money for drugs, move in and squat there and then they can't get rid of them or uh, having relationships where there's interpersonal violence um, and um, uh, they don't feel safe in their own accommodation anymore. In terms of key learnings for us, so it's very clear we know that um, Australia, we need more housing to meet the demand and reduce the waiting lists. Um, However, it's really important when there's all this debate about um, we need more houses, we know need more houses, the solution is simply not more housing. Also, the fact that there needs to be support provided to people to make these models and this accommodation work. And if you just look at 32 clients move into 32 properties, within six months, most of them would have moved out again. Um, the, the housing would have broken down, they would have larger debts, there would have been damage, vandalism, squatters. Um, so we know um, that if you're going to move people uh, who've been sleeping rough into support, the best outcome is that it must come with wraparound supports um, and the, the wraparound supports must be ongoing and, and permanent in some, um, some form. We also know there needs to be choice uh, within the sector um, and that's because we have people with different needs who want to live in different ways just like we all do. Um, and there's some really good examples in the ACT around different sort of models and we welcome more. More diversity means more choice for people and hopefully we can tailor services and accommodation to meet people's needs. Um, I think one of the key things in the discussion that we often have with uh, the ACT government is that it's very clear that um, the government in terms of how it approaches um, uh, commissioning our services and, and, and the services that, that, that they want us to deliver and the services we deliver as, as a, as a uh, not-for-profit community, we need to change the way we work um, so that we can better meet the needs of, of people and in particular complex needs clients and families coming through. Um, and, and I think it's really important around what the evidence says works versus what some of our models deliver and some of our um, I think one of the last points will be that there's always going to be um, uh, people experiencing homelessness in the ACT and, and in Australia. Um, there were always new entrants. We've, we've accommodated uh, uh, up to 32 people and within that time there would have been new people moving onto the streets. 
because of um, exiting custody or um, uh, you know relationship breakdown, drug and alcohol, mental illness, a whole lot of issues would have meant that, that people in, have ended. So what we need, um, this is my opinion, uh, and looking at the readings that you guys have done, is around flexible models um, and looking at a landing platform or some form of entry point for people. And the, the key component of that is fast turnaround so that people have got somewhere to go and then somewhere to exit to um, before either failure happens or institutionalisation happens. Um, uh, we need to be able to get people in and get people out. So an element of rapid rehousing, which has obviously to do with capacity within the sector, but then there needs to be support provided as well. Um, and I think the, the, the other point is around um, that all our initiatives that we need, need that we launch need to be evidence informed. And that's around good intentions don't always deliver good outcomes. Um, and we certainly see at times um, some uh, services and individuals launch these programs um, and, and the question we have is that is, is that actually addressing long-term homelessness or is, is the person then being exited back onto the street the next day? And if so, that's actually not really a solution. It's a stopgap measure um, and, and we can do better from some of the things that we deliver. I always love this quote. There's debate whether actually um, Gandhi said this or not, but obviously true measure of any society is how it treats its most vulnerable members. And then I thought I'd wrap up with what can you do as university students? So um, the key part is around dignity. So approach every homeless person that they're a human being who deserves dignity and respect and recognising that that person on the street is somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's uncle, somebody's cousin. Um, it has, ha, the person has people who, who love them and care for them and they're, they're part of something, they're part of our community. Um, university students, get motivated, uh, get in there, advocate, um, uh, use your vote wisely, speak to your local members, find out what they're doing about homelessness, ask them what's your initiatives around homelessness. If they don't have an answer, maybe give them some suggestions about what they could be doing. Uh, one of the questions always is, what do you do if someone on the street like you had Bolwan approaches you for money? So if you're comfortable and you're able, uh, you can give to people on the streets. Um, Certainly uh, looking at people on the streets, you can see that they, regardless of whether they are homeless and looking for accommodation or they, are, they have accommodation and they're actually um, uh, working, earning an income by sitting on the streets, they are living in poverty. And so it is about supporting people during some very difficult times. Um, also, if you can support your local charities, donate to our services or volunteer your time, which is one of the most um, precious commodities in this era. I'd also say when you graduate from uni and you're going to be uh, professionals, you're going to be uh, uh, Bolwyn, you're going to be a, a, a lawyer, a corporate lawyer, you're going to own your own businesses, um, look back and support the local homelessness providers in your regions, um, sponsor them, um, give back to your community um, where you can. One of the greatest uh, benefits once you are stable in life is to be able to um, uh, give to other people. Um, and lastly, I think um, looking after ourselves, your family and other people in your community is, is, is absolutely key. Early intervention is where we need to hit this. Once people are on the streets at the ages of 30, 40, 50, 60, um, really uh, uh, the horse has bolted in terms of their trajectory and, and, and w where they're going. We know that uh, a large number of the clients that we talk to, almost 100% of them have childhood trauma. So what we're talking about is let's look at early intervention, let's care for people, our children, our communities, what's happening in our schools, um, because that's actually one of the best preventative measures for um, homelessness. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank if you, you want to so know any more, go to our website. Thank you so much for that, Anne. That was yeah, super informative, I think. Um, and that last slide kind of took, uh, yeah, took the words out of my mouth, as in, well, it answered the question that I had prepared earlier, but no worries about that. Um, before we move on, um, I think uh, Louise and Anne, I think there was a short video. Um, sorry, James, just uh, before you before you start talking, there was a short video um, you um, I, I guess uh, you had me prepare to sort of show people um, just a little, uh, I guess, three minute clip about axial housing and what it does. Um, I'll just quickly share that. 
Um, and I'll quickly play that. Um, and I think uh, just hearing the experiences of a, I guess, a homeless, a, a formerly homeless person talk through their experiences with it, uh, yeah, is really sort of profound. Um, so I'll just stop that. Um, just one second. Yeah, I've been living in my cars for over 20 years. Um, had a lot of help here and there off different charities, uh, Vinnie's mainly. And then um, a gentleman in Gundaroo, Ron, told me about Catholic Care. And I gave Catholic Care a ring and was lucky enough to get Connor. I've known him for a little while. And you guys got me a great unit after being in my car for so long. I never thought it would happen. But it's really too nice for us, but we're getting used to it. I'm um, doing gardening, vacuuming, um, everyday chores that living in your car you don't do. And having a cooker with four burners on it instead of one. I'm um, cooking out of the rain, weather, most of all being warm, having a heater. Um, trying to learn to cope with people, maybe I struggle with people. Um, you're just learning to eat properly, growing a bit of weight, and just trying to fit into society really. Being homeless is pretty hard. There's a lot of judgmental people out there. But we're nice people, just got a few problems. <laughs> and how are you finding the neighbours? Yeah, so far so good. They're all a bit older than me, so, and they're quiet. Um, and just want to help, you know. Just want to care. I've been a taker all my life, so now it's time to give back. He, he likes the, the garden, you know, the room compared to the old Trago. But I think he's like me, we still struggle. You know, we're used to having a, a small confined space, nothing like this, but it's great, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> um, <laughs> staying here, of course, <laughs> and just want to help anybody I can. You know, I'm not a counsellor or nothing, but I've been a drug addict, I've been abused, I've done a lot of different things. And we just got to help each other. But most of all, I'm a photographer, I'm trying to be. <laughs> I take great photos, but because I'm homeless, you get judged, oh, you're a homeless bum. Well, I might be a homeless bum, but I'm a great photographer, you know? That's how I said it. <laughs> yeah, being homeless, you know, I was a drug addict all my life. Um, I gave up drugs six years ago. And there is more to, you've got to hit um, lower than rock bottom. I've hit rock bottom, you've got to go, you've got to lose everything. And just go forward in life. You know, what I've got now, I never thought I'd have <laughs> in a million years. You know, Catholic Care's donated me a lot of stuff. The people of Gundaroo have donated me a lot of stuff. And that's just, I, I, I look around and I think TV, lounge, I've never had that. And no, I won't cry because I don't cry, but it's just nice to have a place called home. Um, sorry, on that profound note, um, yeah, so thank you so um, so much to uh, Louise and Anne so far for introducing us to um, what, what the what this problem of homelessness is like um, in Canberra. Um, I think uh, our next step would be to maybe to to offer a different perspective, an international perspective, to zoom out and see um, yeah what what the situation is like um, outside of Australia. And I'll hand over to James um, to yeah to enlighten us on this on this topic. Thanks, Bowen. Yes, my name is James O'Donnell. I'm a research fellow in the School of Demography at, at ANU. And I guess my interest in my research on sort of had a long interest in, in housing and homelessness um, and worked for, for ACT Shelter several years ago and since then have moved into academia. I did a PhD on homelessness and have tried to follow that up now through my, um, through my um, research since. And I also want to thank Louise and, and Anne for their terrific presentations. And uh, it's, it's sort of difficult to follow them and I want to try not to duplicate anything they say and just sort of try to build on that and, and, and try to show you some of the sort of, I guess, the learnings um, for my own research and that puts, puts the Canberra statistics into that national and international perspective, as Bowen was saying. So the, the, I guess there's, the, there's a few points. Um, 
homelessness and housing deprivation, as you would have seen from Louise's definition, and that's an ABS definition, exists on multiple dimensions and not just rough sleeping, crowding, unaffordability, tenure security, couch surfing, being compelled to stay in motel and hostel rooms. We might not consider all or even many of them homelessness, but, but they do reflect housing disadvantage and deprivation. And that's probably best illustrated by that severe crowding category that you might have seen from Louise's presentation. Now, that's the, nationally, that's the largest category of homelessness uh, in Australia and bikes quite some distance. And you might find that kind of strange that that's considered homelessness, and, and I'd probably agree with you, but also recognise that, that that's a very severe form of housing deprivation, the way they measure that. So that's, to be, crowd, to be living in a crowded house and be homeless, it's the equivalent of five adults living in a single one-bedroom home. Um, so, so whether it's homeless or not, undoubtedly it's, it's a very serious form of housing deprivation, and it's quite common too. The next point that, that I want to make is that homelessness, and broadly defined, is, is sort of episodic. So most people experience homelessness move in and out in between different forms of housing and homelessness. So as a result, many more people experience homelessness over a year, over 10 years, over a lifetime, than are counted on a single night. So by my estimates, some recently published research that I have, around 500,000 adults experience homelessness in Australia annually. COVID. COVID, as you've heard, will probably blow it out of the water. But not those living in crowded dwellings. And, th and this figure, that's almost three and a half times larger than the number who would be counted on a single night, such as through a census count. And, and as you know from Anne's presentation, there is a group who experienced that sort of long-term homelessness. But even within this group, there's considerable turnover, as she also pointed out, as new people enter and cycle through temporary shelter, hospitals, prisons, and often and tragically, premature death. Um, so of the 500,000 people, I estimate around about a quarter, one in four, experienced long-term homelessness of, of at least 12 months. And obviously that has a very long tail, um, as Anne said. So, but another substantial population experienced homelessness is sort of a one-off or sporadic occurrence. And I estimate that there's about one in five experienced homelessness of, of no longer than about two weeks. So this sort of episodic nature of homelessness it creates sort of important pathways between the different forms of housing and homelessness. So staying with family and friends in that kind of couch surfing arrangement is by far the most common stepping, stepping stone into and out of homelessness. So of those 500,000 adults, I estimate around about 90% spend some or all of their time couch surfing. Um, and that includes before or after sort of rough sleeping or some other sort of homeless. So most of the burden therefore of homelessness therefore ends up falling on individuals and their interpersonal support networks. And there's that, that private element of homelessness. Um, but people will often and to varying degrees exhaust their social capital, their social networks. And that's often where they can end up on the streets or in shelter. Although as you heard, the, the reasons are complex. Um, so public policy and homelessness and support services are really critical in acting as that safety net when, when, when those support networks fail or they no longer exist. And perhaps also in supporting those support networks and helping people to re-engage with family. And so the broad impact of homelessness and housing deprivation in society and, and, and that diversity of experiences that people have and the diversity in the people themselves who become homelessness, you know, kind of really point to obviously the complex drivers, as others have pointed out, the, the complex drivers of homelessness. Um, and, you know, as Anne says, you, you know, um, fixing homelessness is not just a matter of housing. But there are important kind of structural deficiencies in that housing markets and in that particularly in their relation to employment and social security systems um, that can leave that have a fundamental effect, particularly on the size of homelessness. The, the, the quantum of people who come homeless you know, has, has, is large, is not large, big bearing on that is those structural deficiencies um, in the housing, income and social support networks systems. So there's individual characteristics and the personal histories, along with those public and private homeless support systems, have the larger influence on who becomes homeless for, what, for how long and with what severity. Um, so the elimination and ongoing prevention of homelessness is, is, an, is going to be an ongoing policy problem. 
So as we've long understood in Australia, addressing homelessness requires a multi-problem strategy that can often be boiled down to prevention, early intervention, and intervention to assist people to exit homelessness. And so programs like housing, the Housing First models, they often sit at that, that, that end of uh, assisting people to exit homelessness. And, and Louise's uh, policy agenda, Housing ACT, will focus quite a bit on early intervention through things like tenure services and also on that assisting people to exit homelessness. But then there's that, also that prevention side, and the prevention side is key. And in a country like Finland adopted a similar multi-pronged perspective, and they developed this integrated and holistic strategy to just each of these kind of core elements. Um, and we do that too, and, and we have been doing that, and that was a big theme of um, the government's policy on homelessness when, when the Rudd government, Rudd government came in about 12 years ago. Uh, but what, I guess what this, that sets the things apart in my mind is, is their, their ambition, the scale, and the resources with which they tackled the problem. And their endurance. I think they're coming to the end of their, their third four-year plan, and I think they'll have to continue. I don't think they'll ever rightfully be able to claim victory, and I think Anne touched on this as well. Because of its dynamic nature, the elimination prevention of homelessness is, is, is always going to be an ongoing problem. Um, but that prevention and early intervention is, is really key to making homelessness manageable as a problem in the future, if not eliminating it. And prevention involves orienting those housing and labour markets and social security systems to, to provide better housing security and options. There's a particular emphasis on protecting individuals and families from housing loss when they do have those financial and family, family crises. Um, and while this might ideally involve greater provision of social housing, it also ought to be accompanied by greater affordability and tenure security in the private rental market. So some of my research has shown that there's this volatility in the private rental markets that that exposes vulnerable and previously homeless people to re repeat episodes of homelessness and longer durations of repeat homelessness. Um, in terms of helping people to exit homelessness, that third stage, we, we have lots of information from around the world. So we've heard about the Housing First model. Housing First model is the US many years ago, and it was quite targeted towards people who were, had, they often had sort of a mild to moderate um, mental, mental health issues, but they were still had the capacity to live um, in, in independent housing. So the program was really about helping people to um, find private rental housing, subsidised private rental housing in the sort of mainstream housing market. And the idea was that it would be integrated within the system. In the years, and that was showing great success in helping people to, to secure, you know, stable housing. But I guess in the years as it spread and spread and gone international and gone across the world and, and, and now to Canberra, it's sort of taken on different forms and a lot of the forms outside of the US have, have involved more social housing and, and, and putting people in social housing. And that has a lot of benefits in terms of tenure security, but then often it's not, there's, there can sometimes be an element where there's not that sort of integration into the, the mainstream. But the, the important thing is that there's, to know that, it's, that there's not, what, there's never probably gonna be a single one size fits model, one size fits all model. Different models cater towards different types of and characteristics of people and their personal histories. And that's kind of the, the big advantage in housing first and housing first like models. You put the housing in place that best suits people's needs and you tailor a program of support services around the individual. Um, so to really tackle the homelessness, we, we need to take the learnings from programs like Axial and begin to scale up. You know, scale up our ambition, scale up our programs, scale up our resources, ensure that housing and housing services is demand driven and really central to our, to our social, uh, social safety net. Thanks, Bob, and that's, that's, that's all for me. Thanks a lot for that, James. Um, um, I'd also like to point out, um, just uh, wanted to point out earlier, but yeah, forgot to. Um, yeah, I think beyond Axial Housing, beyond, sorry, beyond Axial Housing, there are also um, other sort of Canberra based initiatives that look into um, housing um, and tackling the problem of homelessness in the ACT. Um, so some that come to mind are ACT Shelter, whose um, CEO Travis is uh, one of our attendees today, um, as well as um, Common Ground ACT. Um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, so just, yeah, it's, it's worth noting that there is there's, there are multiple initiatives out there, each with their slightly different take on um, how housing should go about. Um, yeah, I think that's worth pointing out. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, very much for that, James. Um, it was yeah, really insightful going into um, bringing those different perspectives. 
Um, I think from here, I'd like to go into a bit of um, some questions I've had, I've prepared, um, um, if, you'd, yeah, if you'd care to entertain them. Um, so the first question I have is about, about the, the virus that should not be named should not be named. Um, yeah, so about COVID-19. Um, I think Louise, you briefly touched on this earlier um, about how during COVID we've seen um, a, yeah, a, um, I guess at, what at a surface level seems like a surprising decrease in um, homelessness. Um, yeah, would you mind just uh, expanding a little bit further on that? And um, perhaps, um, yeah, and of course, uh, other panelists, um, feel free to jump in um, as well um, to, yeah, um, put in your own perspectives. Yeah, th um, thanks, James. Look, I, I think um, we have held things in place, if that makes sense, in terms of um, uh, we've stood up a winter shelter, we've um, fast tracked Axial, and we've put in a um, flexible client service fund uh, where we are trying to utilise capacity within the specialist homelessness sector, so those 28 providers. Um, and so we have been, um, I guess, holding things at bay at this point in time. But uh, look, I'll, I'll, I'll point you out to Travis's comment that he's just put on the chat there, where he talks about the temporary increase to job seeker. That has certainly helped. The uh, moratorium on evictions, that has certainly helped. Um, but we are working hard to... Uh, um, I guess behind the scenes on the impacts of those things when they end and look I, I too share um, Travis's concerns as does government um, and certainly um, we are looking to we, we don't want to fall off a cliff um, and I think we've had um, some silver linings as part of, um, of COVID and, and we certainly want to um, keep that going where we can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just having done some digging online, I saw a headline. Uh, one of the ABC reports is that um, yeah, COVID nineteen homelessness response results in hundreds being housed in Queensland. Um, yeah, has this has the coronavirus pandemic proved that homelessness is solvable? Um, yeah, perhaps is that is it just um, there's just needs to be political will there um, potentially. Um, yeah, do you have any? Is there yeah. not enough political Look will? Yeah. Look, I, I think James and Anne both point out thing that, that's needed in terms of solving homelessness, particularly for high and complex um, clients, um, which is often our rough sleeper cohort. And that is you can put them in a house, you can put them in a hotel room, but unless you also have the wraparound supports, um, it's not going to work. Um, it, they might stay for a while and we also had those headlines I think in Perth where we saw lots of homeless people actually leaving their hotel rooms um, because it wasn't sustainable. Um, so I guess fortuitously we'd done the cohort research, we partnered together with Catholic Care and Street to Home and we'd actually stood up Axial in November and I think uh, I, I, you know, I rang Anne and said in January and, and said Anne I think we need to fast track and she went Gilding, you create so much work. But look, um, and, and look, and that, that's part of what also works in the ACT is that we are small jurisdiction, we are able to collaborate. So we didn't put people in hotels. We worked with the housing portfolio to, to work and, and bring forward our vacant stock, um, Catholic care in terms of the wraparound, and they did a lot of assertive outreach with Street to Home to actually make that happen. So um, yes, if you've got houses, and the right supports, then I believe absolutely homelessness can be ended. Yeah. I'll just add to Louise there, uh, Bolwyn, in terms of um, a, one of the one of the gifts of the coronavirus has been the action taken by the ACT government to do what it can in terms of the homeless sector. And luckily, we haven't had an outbreak in the ACT, but what we have been able to do with these initiatives is meet the existing need within the homelessness sector. So you can tell, um, obviously, uh, the issue with people living in abject poverty, the um, increases in um, the, the pension payment and um, obviously job uh, for our clients in terms of getting them off um, living in, in just such a terrible income levels. 
Um, in addition, Axial Housing for Rough Sleepers, McKillop House opened that um, accommodated yes. um, women and women with accompanying children who were homeless. We had the brokerage funds and the client support funds through one link. And then we had the Winter Lodge open for, for uh, men as well. So these were four initiatives, um, very reasonably priced initiatives, Louise. Um, I know, I know, Anne. <laughs> great outcomes um, in the ACT. And so part of what we want to do when Travis, um, and I saw that um, um, uh, Barbara's on here as well, is about how do we advocate to continue these initiatives so that we can meet more and more needs, get more and more people help and assistance. And again, as I said, it's that, it's that get them in, get them out um, quickly so that they're not 25 years later, we're not still trying to support someone who's, who's sleeping rough. I mean, you have to ask what's happened over the years that for 25 years that person has been unable to navigate the steps required to get into the system to get a home. Um, and, and that's where our services are failing people on the streets and we have to change the way we're working. So there's different service models for different clients at different stages in their, in their homelessness life. And, and look, sorry, I'm going to jump back in there, Sarah Bob. And I think that's really important. There's additional funding, but there's also that $25 million of funding that we need to uh, be good stewards of as a community. And it's, it's about government and community and services working together to look at our evidence base, look at our research, and be willing to be flexible and change how we're actually delivering services to get a better outcome, which is what we've we've shown through Axial and hopefully our eva evaluation will also um, show the outcomes there and spur others on to actually um, work to make those changes. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, so my next question is um, something that's uh, I noticed has been already uh, briefly mentioned in the uh, chat. Um, and then that's on the topic of gentrification. Um, so having yeah, moved to Canberra about six years ago, I, I lived in Braddon and just over those six years, I've seen the amount of change undergone in Braddon, just it being converted, Lonsdale Street being converted from, a, from an industrial sort of junkyard um, into a yeah, street full of you know, um, artisanal cafes and uh, fancy restaurants and bars. Um, yeah, it's, I think the pace at which it happened is truly astounding. Um, and just, um, yeah, I wanted to um, ask a bit about, yeah, what the impacts of gentrification, if you've noticed any trends um, in that regard, um, the gentrification of the inner north and perhaps other areas of Canberra and the effect this has had on um, homelessness in Canberra. And perhaps, um, James, if you um, want to talk as well about just sort of gentrification in general and sort of um yeah just any features in in that regard um yeah um any any takers well I, I can, sorry go. go james i i can start with that some of those broad points so i think it, it is an issue and it's sort of been an issue that's sort of um been with us sort of globally since probably since the 70s and and i guess it used to be that um, some of the sort of the lower lower uh, income rental housing, um, some of the sort of really affordable housing options were located located in the inner city areas, and now they've become more desirable places to live. Um, so that certainly has put pressure on that supply of low rent housing. But the low rent housing, I guess, has sort of moved outwards. So it's sort of been a little bit kind of spread the problem a little bit, sort of suburbanized it in a sense. So it sort of shifted it for the to the, to the suburbs a little bit, but, but, but I mean, not so much in terms of rough sleeping. That tends to be quite still quite concentrated in the inner city areas. That sort of housing stress, that housing affordability stress, particularly among those low income renters. Um, so I definitely think that's that's an issue. But it's probably also something that we need to do more research on. We don't have a great um, evidence base on. Um, I guess those sort of local area drivers of people entering homelessness. Um, and that's because homelessness is a different, difficult issue to track. We don't, we, we have the administrative data that, that uh, Louise talked about in terms of the, um, the, the specialist homelessness services. So this is service, so data collected from homeless service providers, but outside of that, the people that don't conf um, front up to homelessness services aren't really tracked in any way. So we don't know necessarily where they come from. And this is sort of a global problem about where they come from or, what are the kind of drivers of home, local level drivers of homelessness? Um, but I think it's, it's something that, that I've started to work on now. And that's sort of my next focus in terms of this, in this space. 
Thank you, James. Um, yep. Did you want to jump in, Louise? Did you? Yeah. Um, you're going to tell me when, tell me when to stop. Um, look, um, uh, actually, um, James, you might be interested in some of our central intake service data. Um, we, unlike um, a lot of jurisdictions, we actually um, keep a, a, a a list of people who are accessing service and needs those supports. So we don't have turnaways. Um, we, ha we have, a, I guess, a higher unmet demand because we actually have a waiting list. And so some of that one link data you might actually find uh, quite interesting um, to interrogate. Um, look, in terms of gentrification, I think we have, we like um, other cities have seen affordability pushed pushed out further, particularly for those folk who are in quintile income um, two. Uh, they're the affordable products, um, we need more. Um, and often you'll find that those in Q2 are sitting just above um, the eligibility quiet criteria for public housing, um, but they get crowded out of the housing market by higher uh, income quintals such as those in um, Q3. What's important about um, public housing though, is that we do have a salt and pepper approach in the ACT. Um, we are determined not to sell the silverware, and to create a donut um, in the middle of our centre, is city centre where there is no public housing. And so whilst we saw the, the renewal along the corridor, along that light rail corridor, um, much public housing was, at, all of that was replaced roof for roof and as much as possible in the centre. So when you look at um, our suburb spread, we aim to try and have six to seven percent in every suburb in Cam Canberra. When you look at Dixon, which was sort of along where that corridor was, we've, we're probably uh, ticking up to more like ten percent. So we are certainly trying to make sure that we have um, a, a great spread of public health across the city that is um, accessible, that's close to transport, close to services, close to shops. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, did you want to jump in, Anne? Yeah, I'll just comment too in terms of one of the things that we're hearing from a lot of people is there's so much more, so many more homeless people on the street, like they're everywhere, what's going on? Um, and I think it's important to note that one of the things that happened when the ACD government did the um, redevelopment of ABC flats in the middle of Civic was there was always a high concentration of um, homeless people in the middle of the city. Um, some of those clients have now moved into some of the suburban areas and so we see them out more in Coombs and out the Kipak shopping centre at Scallon shops. Um, it's not necessarily that they're new entrants to the streets, it's just that they were very hidden um, in the high density area and civic and now they've moved out more into the suburbs, um, they're more visible. Um, but we have always, we're, we're very much a very wealthy but we have always had an undercurrent of poverty in the ACT that's been quite hidden. And now it's just a little bit more in people's faces and it make, makes people a little bit more uncomfortable. And I think that is fantastic because Canberrans are waking up to the fact that there are people in their city who are doing it really tough and we need to do something about it. Thank you and for I'll that. Stop. <laughs> no worries. Um, so the next question I have um, touches on something uh, you briefly mentioned, James, which is about um, Finland. So, um, yeah, um, according to uh, some research conducted recently, uh, Finland is the only European country to where homelessness has decreased in recent years. Um, and the number of social housing apartments doubled um, from, from the 80s till uh, recently. And um, this hasn't completely eradicated homelessness, but it's uh, seen, they've seen a massive reduction. Um, and I think, yeah, so Finland, as you, as you mentioned, has uh, implemented the housing first model. So just to uh, quickly recap, um, so um, the housing first model makes housing unconditional. Um, it says, look, you don't need to solve your problems um, before you get a home. Um, instead, a, a home should be the secure foundation um, that makes it easier for you to solve your problems. Um, and in Finland, there was, there was strong stakeholder engagement, there was strong political commitment um, on, on, the, on the part of the Finnish government, and there were just you know, clear policy objectives. Um, now, I think, uh, don't want to sort of slip into the trap of, you know, saying that the, the Nordic model is the silver bullet for all problems, for all social ills. Um, yeah, and I just want to uh, point out, there, there are some differences between, I think, yeah, Finland and Australia. So Finland does have a population of five and a half million compared to Australia's uh, 25 million. Um, so there's a big disparity there in terms of population size, but if we go down to a city level, um, look, look at Helsinki, which has a population of uh, 
650,000 and Canberra, which has almost 400,000. I think there's a bit more comparability there on the city level in terms of population size. Um, so that was a very long winded way of saying, um, yeah, to what extent does, um, do you see like, I, I think, um, certain differences between Australia and Finland um, uh, prevent the, or prevent or promote the um, implementability of this, uh, the, fin the Finnish housing first model? Um, yeah, do you have any sort of yeah thoughts on that? Any any takers? Any takers there? I'm I'm happy to have a, a, a first shot, but I'm I'm sure others will too because it's a it's a great question, um, and and of course it's implementable in Australia, uh, and and I don't think size is necessarily a barrier. Barrier where it can come into effect is is that what's really impressive about the Finnish model is that. Well, I talked about it a little bit, but it's that sort of integration of um, ambitions, scale, and resources, and that integration that integration across levels of government. And I'm sure Louise, in particular, will agree with this: is that you need you, in a, in a place like Australia to pull something like that off, you need federal government involvement, and you need the the the, the states do a great job, and there's lots of great programs going on, lots of great housing first models and housing first inspired models. But fundamentally, you need to address the different, all the different problems of the problem. So that prevention, early intervention, uh, and that intervention to help people exit homelessness. And it's an ongoing problem that will just, it's, it, it, they're, not, they're never gonna win. They're not, not gonna be able to rightfully claim victory. It's gonna be an ongoing problem, but you can start to uh, address some of those problems by addressing it, some of those big structural issues in your housing market. And that, and that kind of can help to, br to bring it down to at least a manageable program, a manageable pro problem, a manageable ongoing problem then, that then the service providers, dedicated and skillful people like Anne can come in and, and work with people to, to you know, make, make sure that they, they can be rehoused. Um, but it's always going to be an ongoing problem. And, it, and as I say, it's always going to need that, that um, uh, unity of purpose across all levels of government and community to, to pull it off. I suppose before Louise jumps in with her highly educated commentary, um, I'll, I'll just say that there's two key points for me around um, ending homelessness. Um, the first is, is when we look at European models, we need to be very mindful of the percentage of um, houses or property that the European governments own compared to Australia and, and, and that there is a, a lot more... Um, uh, people rent overseas uh, for mm -hmm. their entire life Australia we like to own so in fact there's a, there's a lot of uh, landlords in Australia that are mum and dad landlords compared to the government I think the second part is challenging the government around things like uh, modern monetary we have seen um, the coronavirus that the uh, government can spend money can spend billions of dollars like that um, and um, if you want to stimulate uh, the Australian economy, when we know that um, that um, the building industry is in, in, in dire straits and will soon be in dire straits, there is nothing stopping the Commonwealth um, giving each state billions of dollars for infrastructure. Uh, Louise could spend it. We would use it. Um, it is possible. And I think some of the arguments around um, finance and modern monetary theory need to be challenged because the government have demonstrated that they did it. They made a miscalculation around job seeker and job keeper. Job keeper. They could very easily have diverted a billion dollars to each state as a result of that miscalculation and, and, and put it into social and affordable and community housing. And now we'll go to Louise and, and hers will actually be an evidence-based response. No, and look, actually, Ed, you, you point out an important point, and there's the research. I'll just hold that one up there, um, which ex absolutely explains the differences in terms of the evolution of our housing markets. And I think the first point we need to do is to say in Australia, yes, we can. Can, we can look at what um, our international partners have done and pick the best and pick what suits us and what suits the problems as we define it. But I go back to our structural, systemic and individual issues. Each of the players across our systems, community, local government, territory, state government, federal government, each influence those factors. We, and and to, to, to make a difference, all of the players need to own 
the bits that they control and bits that they influence and work together. So I would love to see a, um, a national housing strategy come together um, where we do see the Commonwealth working with the jurisdictions. I think the Commonwealth has um, great ability to actually leverage what the state and territories are actually doing at the moment. Um, NRAS was the National Rental Affordability Scheme was a great example of everybody having skin in the game. And um, so, you know, the, the Commonwealth put incentives on the table and the territories and had matched incentives. And we saw um, great growth in affordable housing. I think in the ACT, we had over 2,000 incentives. Uh, we rolled our sleeves up and, and jumped on that, on, on that bandwagon in terms of increasing affordable housing. And look, the ANU benefited um, significantly from um, those NRAS incentives. They are coming to an end over the next, I think, four, five, six years. Um, and um, certainly we, um, only only uh, on Friday, uh, I'm certainly presenting a committee hearing in relation to how we all absolutely need to work together to lead the solutions for homelessness and housing affordability in Australia. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive answer, um, all of you. Um, I think, yeah, we, and I think there are some pretty insightful comments um, in the webinar chat as well um, for those of you who are interested in having a look. Um, yeah, thank you for answering that. Um, I think um, next question. Um, so, and you addressed this quite thoroughly in your presentation about what can we do as as students or as as part of the the general public um, to tackle homelessness. Um, I think you, you answered that very comprehensively, but you know, just wondering if any of you had um, anything to add to that um, and to add to that list um, in terms of, yeah, what can we, um, uh, you know, I guess as, you know, at the, if at the moment we are, you know, poor university students um, with very little disposable income, um, I think, yeah, um, did you have any um, ideas um, in terms of uh, how we can contribute to alleviation of homelessness? And did you want to go, or do you want me to go? You go. Okay. Um, look, I think um, when I think you need to look to your strengths as students, and I think that's the first thing in terms of um, what James and Anne have both said is about that early intervention and prevention. And we know that often mental health issues drive. Um, you know, that slippery slope towards homelessness. And so I think as students, it's actually uh, your, your care of each other, you're looking out for each other and asking that question, is you're okay? And trying to then tap into services that already exist to help in that prevention space. Um, I, I think, you know, and material aid is another thing. Um, textbooks are expensive. Rather than doing a collection for blankets for rough sleepers, perhaps it's it's looking at how you do. Um, I, I don't know what textbook exchanges are, but I know psych textbooks are and law textbooks set you back a pretty penny. Um, so it's again looking at those material aids. What have you got in your hand? You know, you've got a whole lot of students there with a whole lot of textbooks and a whole lot of resources. How can you actually bring that to bear to actually help somebody from slipping into homelessness? But then maybe a bigger thing to do. Um, would be um, social enterprise with employment targets for at-risk students. So one of the things we do in Housing ACT is we have a big maintenance contract. Um, we contract that service out it's between 40 and $50 million on an annual basis. So that's a lot of money being spent on um, maintenance for public housing. And so instead of just saying, yes, we were going to pay you for those services, we also have social inclusion and employment targets as part of that contract. So as part of that contract, we ask um, the, the commercial partner to employ, I think we're up to about 250 um, people from different cohorts. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, public housing tenants, um, apprentices, um, and we ask them to make sure that they're actually um, targeting that employment resource to those vulnerable people and vulnerable cohorts. Perhaps there is something that the ANU can do. It's a big business. Perhaps there are um, some, um, some leverage there and some targets in terms of um, employing, uh, providing employment for vulnerable students because we know that if you've got a cash flow, you can afford to pay the rent. Um, so I think it's also about um, being aware 
of your, I'll go back to being aware and um, looking out for your fellow students um, in terms of um, how their well-being is and how, what about their um, material well-being as well. Um, and I just think that um, if you understand the problem, the innovation of students getting together with your ideas, innovation happens at the cross-section of disciplines. And I see, you know, of the, you know, 40 to 50 people that have been involved in this, I am sure that there are many ideas where you can actually focus your strengths on students as on campus to actually do the preventative work. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, James and Anne might have some more ideas. Um, um, sorry, uh, and just before you start, um, I think uh, after after I think this question, we'll move on to a Q and A with the audience. Um, so I just realised there's a sort of yeah, um, like an allow to talk function that I can enable. So um, if you actually want to, I'm tired of hearing my own voice. Um, so if you want to talk, um, actually like make your voice, your yeah, literal voice heard um, on this platform. Um, just I think there's a raise hand function, and I'll be able to sort of allow you to talk and you can ask questions of these panelists. Um, yeah, and that'll happen for the sort of until up until 7.30. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, and sorry, sorry to interrupt, um, take it away. No, you're right. Um, I suppose I just, I just had a, a few points. Um, obviously, uh, we are a, a large community provider um, of welfare services. We don't always agree with government and government policy. Louise and I do not always see eye to eye. In fact, we have what we would call some very robust discussions about what we should be doing and, and funding and that sort of stuff. But it's really important to have a government who is um, prepared to have those discussions uh, uh, and um, be informed and be evidence informed uh, to challenge us as a sector and we then challenge them back. So that's really important that we have a government who um, is prepared to have conversations with us. We haven't always had that um, in government and it's, it's, it's something that um, you never really realise how important it is until it, it's not there. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is around data. Um, data says everything. Um, James and Louise, I think, are people who just thrive off data. It's not my strength, um, but we must support research. Um, the approaches must be evidence-informed. Um, we have, as a sector, traditionally been really good people who do really, really good things, but we must make sure that what we do actually works and makes a difference, and that, that's something that we have to embrace. I think the last thing is just to be mindful um, as a community and as students um, that we do not have a government who has in place a punitive approach towards the marginalised uh, and the poor, but we actually look at what are the systemic issues that are resulting in the situations that are occurring instead of blaming individuals. And certainly, um, the Commonwealth Government has at times had a very punitive approach in terms of how it cares for people who are homeless and sleeping rough and experiencing a number of other issues. And, and we need to, as a society, say we will not tolerate that. And that's about voting. So educate yourselves and get mobile. And now, James. Thanks, Anne. I, I wanted to add just one quick point about what can students do, and that, and that, and that's add one thing to the great list by, from Anne and Louise. One other thing that I want to add is advocacy. The students have been the greatest advocates for social change across so many countries for so many years, and I think this is another area in which which students can have a really big part. And um, there's national campaigns like Everybody's Home that you'd get involved with and become a member of. Uh, local organisations. Uh, shout out to ACT Shelter, um, look on their website, get in touch with Travis Gilbert, harass them, ask them what can, what can we do to get the message out and to, to get get governments on board and, and society on board to really kind of tackle this issue and really kind of come up with that, drive them towards that ambition to, to um, achieve a, you know, zero homelessness. Fantastic. Thank you all for the, those very comprehensive answers. Um, yeah, so... We'll move on to a Q and A with the audience. Um, so, if uh, if you if you have a question to ask, please yeah, I think click the raise hand function and yeah, I'll just um, permit you to talk. And um, yeah, so everyone, please go ahead. Um, also, just to uh, just to let you know, um, this sort of whole session is being recorded. Um, so if you talk and you don't want your voice to be sort of um, in the recording, please uh, send send us an email and or we can sort of mute your um mute your yeah mute your voice um yeah I'm, hey um while, while you're waiting for a question um i i'm going to jump back in there and um 
um, just note that what Anne was saying in terms of a government who actually is open to ideas and 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 um, uh, talking about homelessness. And uh, Minister Berry is currently the Minister for Housing and Homelessness in the ACT, or well, for Housing and um, Suburban Development in the ACT. And um, I meet with her on a regular basis and she regularly asks me about our rough sleepers. And so I need to, go, even at that high level, she knows who they are and she will specifically ask me about particular clients, about particular people on the street. Um, and then we'll move on to the other strategic or other business. But um, she is focused on our homelessness cohorts and reducing homelessness. So I, I, yeah, I just have to um, have to put that out there in terms of uh, we have had a minister that has driven the results over the last four years and an increase in funding. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think aren't any hands being raised? Perhaps I'm. Um, yeah. Um, I might just ask some questions that are already in the chat um, and see. Um, yeah, so one question from Raylene is, how can I, as a university staff member, get insights into the current number of students that might be homeless? And that's specifically on the ANU, um, at the ANU or just overall? Um, question doesn't say, but perhaps, oh, hang on, um, I'll allow Raylene to talk. Um, Hi, <laughs> can you hear me? Lovely. Yeah, um, yeah I guess um, it would, I think it would be quite shocking for some people um, to consider that that's impacting the life, that homelessness is impacting the lives of students mm. and um, in our changing times there's lots of pressures. Um, I know from experience particularly at the beginning of academic years it's very very difficult and there can be all kinds of fallout there. Um, so yeah I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm in a position to advocate but if I like you said Without the data, <laughs> it's very hard to to get that traction. So how, and I believe you're saying that Canberra is much better with the data collection. How can we um, put a case using data, um, a, a case together to have support in that area? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Raylene, it's a really tricky. Um, <sighs> It, it, it's a tricky area and it's and it is can be quite frustrating in terms of trying to get that that daily and accurate data we know um, we we can drill down to our one link or our central intake data uh, in terms of the different cohorts and we could assume from the age of cohorts that they may or may not be students I'm not sure if we collect student data down to that level but then that would only tell you those people who have actually connected in with us to um, to seek help and seek services. And so I guess there might be other proxy um, uh, data collections that you might be able to use, such as your student wellbeing, um, such as uh, in terms of, I don't know if there are mental health and wellbeing services on site as well. And so it might be, you know, I, I, I will certainly absolutely have a think, but I think there might be some other proxy data that the ANU uses that you could then start to establish, um, you know, use as a proxy for homelessness. Um, if I may just jump in, um, I think, uh, so PASA, the Postgraduate and Research Students Association, um, in 2018, I want to say, um, conducted a home away from home campaign addressed at, um, yeah, sorry, um, aimed at addressing um, student homelessness. Um, I think, yeah, the PASA might be worth getting, um, might, might, might be a worthwhile contact um, in terms of these statistics. Um, yeah, just to put that out there. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Andrea Morris. Um, I'll give you the floor to talk. Hi, um, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from the United States, but I'm here at the ANU now. And I just wanted to say one of the fastest ways to find homeless students is to ask the maintenance staff because they find them in sleeping in hallways and in stairwells and they, and to use like a support 
things like that. Um, so I guarantee you, if you want to talk to maintenance staff, they tell you. Um, the reason I, I, I share that is I used to um, um, operate homeless shelters and programming in the United States, and that's where we would get calls from um, maintenance people. Um, for on behalf of students. So it, that's just a quick anecdote. Um, but the main reason I wanted to, to ask the question is often student groups, um, you know, they do things like bake sales or other kinds of fundraising enterprises. You know, they, they gather coats or, or socks or gloves and hats. Are you finding that community groups and student groups are providing this kind of support? Um, to you, Anne, for example, or are you in need of this kind of thing? And, um, you know, how could we best, um, you know, provide support to your efforts? Hi, Andrea. Um, so, absolutely, what we find is that um, the ACT, but actually in Australia, is, is a very generous community in terms of um, donations. Um, what we do have is a challenge. So, for example, with axial housing, we suddenly had uh, you know, a period of maybe three months where we housed 15 people. Um, we put a shout out to community that we needed lounges and we needed TVs and we needed beds. And we get the offers of so much stuff, we don't have anywhere to store it all. Um, so this, this is one of the challenges in terms of how do we sort of drip feed ourselves for, for some of this stuff so that the next, so tomorrow we're housing someone, um, we've got a couch, we've got a bed, we've got a fridge, we've got a washing machine, we've got everything that we need. Um, it's, I think it's one of the difficult things with charities and I, I know that Vinnie's has uh, similar issues. Um, I think one of the, the better things to do, so we do get donations, we get winter blankets, we get coats. Um, uh, we've had people drop masses of food parcels out to McKillop House. Probably the easiest thing for charities though, which is the, probably the yuckiest thing to ask for is money. Um, because if, you, if cash donations come in from fundraising, then you can use those funds to, to direct it to wherever you need it. Um, so for example, we won a Hands Across Canberra grant for Axial Housing. We went out and bought 20 fridges. Um, uh, it's, it's that sort of stuff for us instead of giving people secondhand goods that sometimes, you know, fail after 12 months. Um, but certainly if we were to put a shout out, we would be inundated with, uh, with donations. There's no question. It's just about how much do we need and where would we put it all. So, for example, the ANU students, if they were to do some kind of specific effort, it would be to raise money. That would be the, the message we would want to share. Okay. Yeah, I think so, but but obviously people don't like to give just money, so we'd need to make it very clear if the money is towards targeted for to buy five beds or to buy five washing machines or to buy, um, you know, to sponsor a bed of a homeless person for a year so that people actually, they don't just see they're writing a cheque, but they're, it, it, they're buying something with their money. Something will be delivered for, the, for that. Excellent, excellent advice. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question, Andrea. Um, we've got a question now from Marie. Um, I, it's not, this isn't a question to um, the panelists, but to the students. Um, that I'm a ACD housing um, a tenant, and I see a lot of prejudice um, from people uh, towards people that are um, living in public housing. How can the students, because they're all very um, creative and they've got imagination, how can they help um, change the minds of people that are prejudiced against people living in public housing? I suppose uh, if I were to give an answer to that, I think it would be um, what the, the method uh, James suggested earlier, which is um, student advocacy. Um, so student advocacy is um, can be a very powerful force for change. Um, student associations at the ANU, so both PASA and ANUSA, um, have uh, in the past, uh, so sorry, those are the two, that's um, ANUSA is the Undergraduate Students Association and PASA is the Postgraduate Students Association. Um, so both students associations, student associations in the past have uh, led many um, campaigns, not just, you know, within the university, but um, sort of uh, among the general public um, to sort of, um, uh, to influence um, in, in some respects um, the, uh, 
the public's perception of um, on certain issues, um, I think. So uh, Anusa, for example, uh, last year um, organized, um, uh, well, I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, to do with uh, the climate strike, I think, because university students feel very strongly about climate change um, and the environment. And, and so there was um, a mass student mobilization in that regard that brought about uh, what we, we like to think brought about some sort of um, influence, policy um, influence. Um, and I think that type of um, energy and uh, initiative can be channeled into um, homelessness, as well as um, what, what the problem you brought up, Marie, about um, about perceptions of, of um, perceptions of the homeless community um, among the general public. Um, so I think, yeah, through these, perhaps potentially there are there is um, a room within yes students uh, for, and, and potential for students to sort of bring about this kind of change. Thank you, and I'd like to say that it'll be to change my life because sometimes if I say I'm on public housing then it, they sort of like look down at me. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, very sorry to hear that. That's That's been the case for you. Um, yeah, that's absolutely something that, um, yeah, students can look into. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, sorry, I'll just comment on that. Uh, I think it was Maria to say that um, on the street I live in, I am surrounded by public housing tenants and private renters, and I can tell you the public housing tenants take much better care of their property and their gardens than the private renters do. Uh, and the private renters have a lot more parties as well. So there's a lot of prejudice out there and it's got a lot to do with ignorance in terms of people's perceptions. Thank you. Um, we've got nine minutes to go. Does yeah, anyone have, um, any, yeah, have uh, any questions they'd like to ask of the panelists? Um, Rayleigh, and I still I see you still got your hand up. Do you did you have oh sorry, um Soraya, um that's um I think Soraya, you're next. Um I'll allow you to chat. Uh yep, Soraya, you can ask your question mm -hmm. if you have yep. one. Cool. Um yeah, thank you so much. I think that was really interesting. Cool. Uh, so I am a student. Um, I've been volunteering with the Red Cross Roadhouse for uh, almost two years now. Um, so we basically give out meals to homeless people. Um, you know, broke down a lot of the prejudices I had uh, towards homeless people. Um, one thing I noticed there was that there was a very high proportion of um, trans people um, among the clients, and it it like my impression was it was almost you know 50 percent that was probably it was probably less than that but that was kind of my impression and i was just really baffled and and um so i have two questions one is like what are the factors that lead to that and my second one is is um are you doing anything specifically um to help trans people um who are homeless or uh raising data on that or anything like that Um, thanks, um, Soraya. I suppose I, uh, two comments on that. Um, we certainly know as the homelessness sector that the provision of support to trans people um, can be challenging um, uh, in that majority of our services are targeted at gender specific. So they're homeless men's services, homeless women's services and uh, transgender uh, clients don't necessarily fit within that. Um, I, I certainly uh, find that what we encounter is um, intolerance and discrimination against uh, transgender clients. And sadly, it often comes from the other people living in the shared housing. Um, so again, it's talking about uh, accommodation that meets the needs of people, a variety of, of needs of people, um, and that it, it can be challenging to have uh, to to provide accommodation to people who are transgender in gender specific uh, uh, shared accommodation, um, it's not the way it should be, but it, it is what happens um, um, within um, the the client group, especially when there has been experiences of violence and and, and fear. Um, then, um, if you were to have in a women's service um, a transgender client who is who is female, you can certainly have. Um, some intolerance there um, from the other residents um, 
So it's something in terms of sector gaps. There are a number of gaps within the homeless sector, and that is one of them where uh, the, the, the current system isn't working for that uh, group of people, and we need to do something about it. Um, I can't remember uh, the second paper, but I suppose the, the, the one thing is, is, the, is the example in terms of we've just uh, pro provided um, housing first accommodation to transgender person in the last week. So it's a fantastic outcome for that person. But sadly, that, that, that really is somebody who's been unable to navigate the, the homelessness and housing system. So now they've got a permanent home, but it shouldn't have to come down to that for somebody to get accommodation. Yeah. Um, and I've just, um, Anne is right, this is a, certainly um, an emerging issue and there are gaps in terms of our service system. Um, and so as a person who um, has system influence, um, when we look at the, um, the contracts and the service funding agreements that we have seen across that 24 million, 25 million with our 28 providers, um, as part of the cycle of the work that comes through, um, when those contracts um, uh, are coming sort of nearing the end. Um, my team, we work with the design to do the data analysis and to look at what are those emerging services, service gaps, and how do we actually reposition going forward yeah. um, and redesign our services and redesign our delivery. And this is certainly a space that we need to be looking at. Um, there's a lot of good research coming out um, from Canada, uh, particularly around the impacts of um, transgender and how, how it actually drives homelessness. So uh, we will certainly be looking to that research, but also our own make sure that our services are designed flexibly to provide the diversity and the support as needed to people in all their in all in all forms in all shapes and sizes yep. great thank you so much fantastic um and we've got one final question um from my uh learning communities colleague bobby um go ahead bobby um, all right so at the start of the talk you mentioned a little bit about increasing number of homeless people who are actually not born in Australia. Um, and I was wondering if you could just delve a little bit more into what factors actually drive that kind of um, homelessness and whether there are like any differences between that and those people who are born in Australia, as well as any barriers you might see or do see in them accessing services provided, especially if, for example, they're not citizens, there's cultural mm -hmm. um, barriers and things like that and does it actually make them make it harder to detect and harder to provide services for them gee what a question to end on <laughs> that's a fantastic question um uh, james did you want to start or do you want me to start oh you go ahead thanks so much <laughs> um so Look, I'm going to take it back to where I started around my structural systemic and my, you know, those, those groupings of factors. And what we often see, uh, particularly with our asylum seekers and our refugees, is that it's the status of their visas and something so simple about whether they can work or not can drive homelessness. Um, and so often if somebody doesn't have um, an income, um, they can't pay for housing. And so we, um, we have uh, various supports, uh, support uh, programs specifically targeted at, at migrants and refugees um, and, and at asylum seekers because we absolutely see that as a growing cohort. Um, but again, it's about those structural barriers, about residency, about incomes that certainly drive um, the homelessness within those cohorts. Yeah, I, I agree with all of those points, and and I also point out that 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 you know it can show up in different ways. That sort of issue of migrant housing, and it goes back to that point that I, I raised right at the start about the different dimensions of of housing deprivation. Because uh, the, when you think about cr household crowding, household crowding, the largest category of homelessness in Australia, and it's been growing uh, at least since sort of 2011. And a lot of that has been within sort of migrant families and, and migrant families living in multi-family households. And as Louise says, a lot of that is driven by, um, you know, the kind of the circumstances, particularly around which they arrive. So, so we obviously have a, quite a diverse migration program. In fact, we, we bring across some sort of highly skilled, high income migrants who, who generally have high employment rates and high, high incomes and, and they do reasonably well. It's, as Louise says, it's, it's, particular issues around the asylum seekers and the refugees, but also around others on temporary visas, particularly the, some of the temporary student visas. So there's very high unemployment rates among 
among students on temporary visas. And sometimes that doesn't always show up as, as rough sleeping, but it, you know, it can show up as, as again, as crowded housing, as living in sort of dormitories and for one of the better terms, sort of slum housing. Um, and so there's a whole myriad of issues, particularly around migrant housing and, and among sort of those, those that come on um, temporary visas and the sort of lower income, particularly at the lower income spectrum. Yeah, and look, I would add to that domestic violence is also a big factor in that as well. Um, and often that um, starts to, um, certainly um, people who have migrated to Australia um, who don't necessarily speak the language very well um, and who are in, um, in, in, in finding themselves in those um, violent family situations, um, that they can be some of, um, uh, you know, uh, tragic consequences in terms of um, homelessness um, in that space and often um, uh, caught between systems um, and caught in our in in, in, in terms of um, um, language barriers uh, status barriers uh, income barriers legal barriers um, and uh, can often be in extraordinarily difficult and traumatic situations I think I'll just add to that one of the challenges that we've had in the homelessness sector has been the impact of Commonwealth policies um, affecting um, the status of uh, migrants uh, and refugees and asylum seekers. And we certainly saw um, a significant impact of, uh, in terms of our homeless and housing services as a result of people seeking um, asylum or refugee who are entitled to nothing. Uh, one of the things in terms of the ACT government working with us as providers to respond to changing needs was that I think last year they, they have funded um, a service to provide homelessness support um, to refugee um, and asylum seekers um, because basically that cohort of clients who have no income and no money were coming in through the homelessness services and the charities were supporting them um, for significant periods of time unable to access any funding um, through the Commonwealth um, because of their, their business status or whatever. So, I mean, that's a really good example of us feeding into the ACD government, what's happening that's having an impact on us, people who are in the homelessness sector who shouldn't be there, and then the uh, ACD government funding a support service to respond to that. Uh, we also have at times challenging issues with um, people with um, New Zealand residency and how we work with them uh, in terms of accessing benefits and they end up in the homeless system and that often relates to mental illness um, and, and issues that um, are occurring there. Um, and the last one I'll just comment on will be um, we will certainly see, we've saw already with the impact of JobKeeper, um, if a government changes significant policies across the nation, they, will, they have impact on people who sit within certain socioeconomic belts. Um, and we will see an impact on migrants um, uh, and migrant workers if they make more changes. I mean, there was a whole cohort that were just totally not eligible as a result of the government making decision about who was in and who was out. Um, and, and of course, what happens is, is who supports people in crisis? Well, it comes into the charities and the social services sector. So. Um, Government policies have a significant impact on what happens within uh, services on the ground, people sleeping on the streets. Thank you very much for those comprehensive answers. Um, and unfortunately, that does bring us to the end of our evening. Um, I would like to thank um, the panelists again, um, Louise, Anne and James. Um, thank you so much for um, donating two hours of your time to talk about um, talk about this, um, this, this topic that you've poured so much of your time and um, effort into. Um, and thank you to everyone in the um, audience who's, who's, who've actively participated in the chats, who've asked questions. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate it. Um, once again, I think uh, this session is recorded and will be made available. Um, we'll post it on the ANU Learning Community's YouTube page. So uh, keep an eye out for that over the next week or two. Um, I think someone in the comments asked um, potentially whether they could have access to the slides um, that um, Anne and Louise um, presented. Um, if there's no problem with that, I can um, find a way to distribute it, um, for, probably via email. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's um, everything from me. Once again, um, this event um, took place through um, a new learning community. So we do, um, we do focus on um, topics that are a, bit more uplifting than homelessness. Um, so we do look at things like art, uh, 
of creative arts, history, culture, uh, global challenges and sustainability, um, different facets of, um, and yeah, just facilitates um, academia and uh, learning outside of a classroom context. So um, if you enjoy this event, um, yeah, please feel free to tag along to our other events as well. Uh, just keep an eye on our Facebook page or subscribe to our newsletter. Um, yeah, and thank you all um, once again for being here tonight. Um, I think it's people like you and, and panelists like you that yeah, make, I think, um, these events possible. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, did you, any of you have any closing remarks or should I end the meeting here? Thank you, Bowen. It was a terrific session. Well done. I'd love to see more of it. This, this is part, big part of what makes a difference. And I, I hope this continues and I hope you kind of maintain that passion and that drive because you can make a difference and we, we, we all can. Thank you, James. Ditto. Thank you. <laughs> Been a privilege. Thanks.